Hello and welcome to the session in which we would look at asset utilization ratio. To be more specific, we're going to be looking at total asset turnover, fixed asset turnover, inventory turnover, and days sales in receivable. Before I start, I would like to remind you to check out my website, farhatlectures.com, especially if you are an accounting student or a CPA candidate. If you're a CPA candidate, whether you are taking Wiley, Glime, Roger, Becker, Sargent, or any other course, I don't replace your CPA prep course. I supplement. I can be a useful addition to your CPA course where I explain the material a little bit more in detail. So you can check out my CPA material. If you're an accounting student, you can check out my accounting courses. I have practically every accounting course covered that you will cover in college. If not for anything, check out my website to find out where does your university rank for the CPA exam. In other words, what's the passing, the pass rate for your university, overall pass rate and pass rate by section. Also, I have ranking by countries. Also, if you haven't connected with me on LinkedIn, please do so. Subscribe to my YouTube and follow me on Instagram and Facebook. The first sets of ratio we're going to be looking at is asset and fixed asset turnover. Now, the reason I put them together because they are similar. Let's examine the numerator. Numerator is sales in both assets. So notice we are taking sales and dividing sales by a different number. Sales by total average asset, the total, and sales by fixed asset. Let's see what they mean first. So this way we can interpret them. We'll use some examples. Then we'll explain the overall picture. Basically, those ratios, whether it's total asset or fixed asset, measure the value of company sales or revenue relative to the value of assets and fixed asset. Let's, let's start with the first ratio, this ratio here. Now, when you are dealing with ratios, the way you want to understand them is by using simple numbers to interpret them. Once you know how to interpret them, then you can apply them to any situation. So let's take a look at a company where they have sales of $1,000 and total assets of $10,000. Well, I use those numbers because they're gonna give me an easy ratio, which is 10%. Now, how do we interpret 10%? First, you need to know what does the ratio mean? Well, what it, tell, what it, tell us, what it tells me is this company have assets of 10,000, and from those 10,000 assets, they generated $1,000 in sales. What I can say is this. They are generating 10% of their sales from assets. So they are like using, utilizing, they're milking their assets to generate from those assets 10%. Now, if another company, let's assume another company, they have 1,000 in sales, but 5,000 in assets, guess what? These two companies are not equal. Although the sales is the same, $1,000, this company, if this is company A and this is company B, company B is doing better because they're generating more sales, more sales per dollar amount than company B. So this is basically an, efficient, an efficiency ratio. Now, how can you improve this ratio? Obviously, you want this ratio to be as high as possible. How can you improve this ratio? Well, one way to do it, if you cannot increase your sales, lower your assets. Notice what we did here, lower your assets. Or if you could increase your sales without increasing your assets or do both at the same time, increase your sales and reduce your asset at the same time. So this is a good ratio. Now, is this is 10% good, is 20% good? For the asset turnover, each industry and each company is different. In a moment, I will have a comparison just to let you know that all ratios you, you have to take them within a context. So you cannot interpret 10% good or bad unless you compare it to a competitor, compare it to another period, or compare it to the industry in general. So you could compare it to yourself from a prior period. You could compare it to a, a competitor, and you could compare it to the industry. Now, when you, those com when you do those comparison, you have to take into account other factors. Like if you want to compare yourself to a competitor, you want to make sure you and the competitor are using the same revenue recognition principle, the same way you account for assets, so on and so forth. So there are, you know, many, many things you have to take into account when you're using those ratios in the real world. Now, for certain companies, fixed asset is important. For example, construction companies, uh, places like Home Depot, because they have a lot of property, plant, and equipment, where there is a high use of fixed asset. We could do a similar computation, basically looking at sales, $1,000 in sales, I'm going to be using the same numbers, divided by 10,000 in fixed asset, because total asset include also current assets. Now what we're doing, we're only uh, focusing on how much 
your fixed asset are contributing to your sales. So if you want to compare two retailers, like for example, Home Depot to Lowe's, rather than comparing total assets, you want to compare how well are they using their fixed asset. And there's something I should have mentioned from the beginning. Let me uh, point out something to you. Notice in the numerator, we have sales as one figure. In the denominator, we use average asset. Average assets means year one plus year two divided by two or the beginning of the year plus the end of the year divided by two, the same thing. Why do we use average asset and in the numerator we use only one figure, not the average sales? Well, here's why. Because sales, when a company generates sales, they count the sales for the whole year. However, when we're looking at assets, assets are a point, it's a balance sheet number and it's a point in time. So you don't wanna take a number that you worked on the whole year and compare it to the last day of the asset. Why? Because the last day of the asset, you could get rid of some of your assets and make yourself look good. So what we do is we'll take beginning asset or year one asset plus year two divided by two. This way we average our asset out. So this way the numerator and the denominator are using the same, uh, the same benchmark basically. Okay, so that's why we use, when we're looking at the balance sheet, we use average numbers. When we're looking at the income statement, we use a single figure because the income statement measure a period of time. Once again, to make sense of those ratios, for example, let's assume this is the total asset turnover for a company. We can compare it from year to year. For example, it, it's basically consistent, 2015, 2016, 2017. Notice the average industry is 0.7. So the industry is better than this company, whatever this company is. So this is how you compare your, the ratios to make sense of them. You compare them to something else. So this company, it's not doing as good as the industry, at least for 2017, because we have the average industry for 2017. The industry, they're generating 70 cent for every dollar in asset. They're generating 70 cent in sales and every dollar in assets. The, this company is only generating 60 pennies. That's, 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 that's a big difference. That's a big difference. Let's take a look at the second asset because this is about asset utilization inventory. Inventory, well, we can compute inventory turnover. How do we compute inventory turnover? We take cost of goods sold, which is an income statement account, divided by average inventory, which is the beginning of the period inventory plus the end of the period or year one plus year two. Same concept, we're using average in the denominator because it's a balance sheet account. What does it tell us? This ratio is showing how many times a company has sold and replaced its inventory during a, a given period. So let's assume this is a store and how many times we filled out the store, sold everything, filled out the store again, sold everything, filled out the store again, then sold everything. We want to do this as many times as possible. How do we compute this ratio to turnover? Because we want our turnover to be high, assuming obviously we are making a profit. Because if we're selling our inventory at loss, we can really sell our inventory really quick. But if, it's, if we're not selling it at a profit, it's not good. So again, let's use some numbers. Let's use for uh, for cost of goods sold, 1,200. And let's use for uh, for average, our average inventory is 100. So 1,200 divided by 100 equal to 12. And I did this on purpose. What does that mean? It means you, you turn over your inventory 12 times a year. What does that really mean? It means every month. So if, if this is a store, I can, please don't, don't judge me for my, art skills. So what you do is you fill out the store once every month. Then by the end of the month, everything is sold on average and you fill it out again and you do this 12 times. Now you want this ratio to be as high as possible. The best way is to have this ratio 365. So every time you buy the product, you sell it immediately, right? So this is basically you are, you know, you're not, you don't have any inventory. You keep on turning over your inventory. Now this ratio there's a lot of lot of things you have to be aware of when you're comparing one company to another. For example, one company could be using FIFO, another company could be using LIFO for their inventory. Also, some companies, what they do, they might have a large year-end purchase. And as a result, they may increase their average inventory, which in turn lower their turnover. So when you're looking at these uh, ratios, you always have to go a little bit in details, a little bit further to find out what is going on. Okay. Also, you have to take a look at inflation for that matter. For example, inventory. For example, if you're comparing year one to year two or the beginning of the year versus the end and you have inflation, your inventory figures at the end of the year might be higher, not because you have more units, 
just because you are paying more the cost is higher so always and always ratios you have to be careful now from this ratio we can compute something called days sales and inventory in other words how many days your inventory is sitting on the shelves like okay it's 12 times how many days it's sitting on the shelves again the reason i chose this because it's an easy number to compute looks at the average time a company can turn it, it, its inventory into sales okay it's taking if you take inventory divided by cost of goods sold times 365 or the way i like to do it basically if you if you already computed inventory turnover take 365 divided by the turnover by the, which happens to be 12 so approximately it's taken you 30 days on average 30 days to sell your inventory now you want this number to be low in other words you don't want your inventory to be sitting in your store for a long period of time for example apple okay apple has really high, uh, low days high high inventory turnover and low day, days sales to inventory on average at some point it's like seven days literally one week seven days so apple they turn over their inventory once every week seven days so that's pretty good it means they have a high turnover low day sales in inventory let's take a look at another asset which is receivable well we're going to first look at account receivable turnover it's very similar to in concept to inventory turnover we're both talking about turnover what are we looking at here when we compute the account receivable turnover where we're looking at how many times you sell on credit you collect the money sell on credit collect your money sell on credit collect the money sell on credit collect the money sell on credit collect the money so on and so forth now the best way like like a, a typical average should be 12 in other words you sell your invent you sell your product and you give your customers 30 days to pay a month it means you have have um, account receivable turnover of 12 it means every 30 days you collect your inventory now how do we compute this now in the real world it's hard to compute this number unless you have inside information because the true way to compute this is take an average account receivable divided by credit sales to be more specific net credit sales it means sales minus returns and allowances minus discounts but companies don't provide you with credit sales so in most textbook they say average receivable divided by sales but it's not really meaningful and it's, it's not true in a sense that you don't you, you should compute it by net credit sales not by sales so this ratio you have to be careful whether the company is using cash method or accrual whether the company has selling on account for example a lot of companies they don't sell on account in other words they don't sell using their own credit they accept credit cards but for example home depot home depot they have their own credit therefore this ratio will make sense because they're selling you they're using home depot credit card if you use their credit card so they can measure how long it's taking to collect so this ratio is important in terms of credit policy for example if you want your um, if you want you if you if you want to have a good turnover you have to make sure you have a good credit policy in other words don't give credit to everyone if you do give credit to everyone your sales sales will go up but when it comes to collection your receivable will stay longer on the books and you're going to have more bad debt also it tells us about your collection policy how well you are collecting your money do you have a good collection department so this ratio could be used externally it could be used internally by management to manage the company also this ratio is affected by macroeconomic economics factor for example if the country goes through a recession like the financial crisis or covid or who knows what's going to happen next people are if, if they don't have money to pay their home depot they're not going to pay their home depot they're going to pay their mortgage first right uh therefore this this ratio will be affected by factors like this so when you study this ratio you have to kind of look at many factors when you are comparing this ratio to prior periods from this ratio we have something similar to today's sales and inventory we have day sales and receivable or average collection period again how many days it's taken you on average to collect your money okay so it's the account receivable per dollar of daily sales and we can compute this by taking average account receivable divided by annual sales again here annual sales is questionable and from a textbook perspective divided divided by 365. also what we can do we can take once we find the turnover once we find the turnover we can take the turn over divided by 365 to find this ratio so i'm sorry not 360 365 365 divided by the turn over so if your turnover is 12 let's assume this number happens to be 12 
uh, which is again if I can make a 12 1200 and 100 in credit sales which make a 12 then on average it's taken you 30 days to collect your receivable now if last year it was taken you 40 days well you either improved your collection policy or improved your credit policy or if it, if last year was taken you 20 days then you know, your your credit policy is uh, something wrong with your credit policy or your collection policy, or we have some macroeconomics factor that people are simply not paying their bills because, you know, they have other priorities uh, to worry about. For example, this company is, it's taken them 100, one, almost 100 days to collect their money. Again, is this good? Is this bad? We really don't know. We have to compare this company to the industry. So the, if the industry is, let's assume, 60 days, well, that's really bad. It doesn't really have to be bad. Um, why? Because let's assume you want to take your chance. You want to, you want to sell to less credit-worthy customers because you want to increase your market share. Then that's fine if that's, if that's what you want to do. But generally speaking, you don't want to be too far away from the industry in general, unless you have a really good reason. If your reason is to obtain market share, then by all means, sell to less credit worthy client. You, you will have a longer collection period. As always, I'm gonna invite you to like my recording, share it, and I'm gonna remind you about my website, farhatlectures.com, whether you are studying for your CPA or your accounting courses. I don't replace these courses. So if you're taking any of these courses, I don't replace them. I can't replace them. I, I wish I can, but I can't. That's not what I do. I can add value to these courses if you sign up to my website. So check out my website, farhatlectures.com. Study hard, stay safe, and good luck.